and I'm going to start off, and I'll take the first 20 minutes or so, and we'll talk about uh, diagnosis, how we diagnose sleep apnea, how we suspect it, and then Dr. Hunter is going to talk about um, surgical options for uh, sleep apnea. So I'll start with uh, talking about diagnosis and then also types of sleep apnea, as well as uh, some typical treatments, and then, as I said, Dr. H uh, Hunter will talk about uh, uh, surgical options. So one of the, you know, wh why are we here? Why, why do we care about sleep apnea? What's so important about sleep apnea? Why are we interested in it? Why am I interested in it? And why are patients that are, uh, that are watching this, what might your concerns be? So the, the reasons we treat, I usually tell people that, you know, there's three reasons that people usually come to see me about sleep apnea. One is here on the left, uh, they just, you feel crummy. So sleep apnea, we'll talk a little bit about what happens, but sleep apnea, uh, can disturb the quality of your sleep. So you may get an adequate amount of sleep, an adequate quantity of sleep, but the quality of your sleep uh, it can be fragmented and disrupted by sleep apnea, which is, uh, which is when you have repeated uh, episodes where you stop breathing at night and those can wake you up. And even if you don't remember waking up, even if you're only awake for a, a few seconds, uh, it fragments your sleep, takes you out of a deep, more uh, deeper restorative sleep, uh, fragments that sleep, so it's just not as restored of good quality sleep. So even if you get eight hours, you just may not feel refreshed. Uh, people can feel uh, fatigued or tired. They can feel sleepy. That's the most kind of specific symptom. If you're feeling sleepy, uh, that suggests that you're getting inadequate quality sleep. But some people feel fatigued. For some pe people, it's concentration, irritability, trouble with memory, a whole variety of kind of cognitive effects from getting poor sleep. A uh, second reason that people will come to, come to me is because they're annoying somebody else, namely their bed partner. So uh, I'll often get uh, people that are kind of brought in or told to go in because they're snoring, which disrupts their partner, their partner can't sleep well, uh, or their partner is just concerned about them because they hear them stop breathing and they think they're dying at night and they're con very concerned about that. So uh, they're often brought in at the, uh, at the behest of a, of a, a bed partner. And we also, when we, if we treat, we'll talk about treatment options for sleep apnea, but if we treat sleep apnea, there are studies that show that you actually improve, not surprisingly, the quality of the bed partner. So you get kind of a two for one when you're treating sleep apnea. The third reason is something that's really become more, uh, we've become more, a lot more aware of in the last, I'll say 20 years or so. The first two, uh, being sleepy and tired and also snoring were relatively, uh, been kind of known and associated strongly with sleep apnea all along. But we also know that uh, untreated sleep apnea affects your heart and your brain health. So there's many studies that show, and most of it, largely, it's uh, the, uh, is har the heart effects, the cardiac side effects of that that we see. So we know that if you have untreated sleep apnea, it increases your risk of having high blood pressure, of having heart attacks, of having strokes, of having pulmonary hypertension, uh, with, of having atrial fibrillation and having congestive heart failure. It also increases your risk of a host of other medical problems, including uh, glucose intolerance and diabetes, um, uh, erectile dysfunction, uh, in addition to besides diabetes, also um, cognitive, long-term cognitive effects like dementia. So all these things, they have higher risks, in particular the cardiovascular uh, side effects or, or comorbidities or side effects that um, have been studied. It's been shown that if you can diagnose sleep apnea, and treat it, you can actually reduce many of these risks. So if you have atrial fibrillation, for instance, uh, and you have sleep apnea, if you have both of those, if you treat the sleep apnea, it's easier or more likely to be able to keep you out of atrial fibrillation or get you out of atrial fibrillation and keep you there. If you have heart failure, we can actually uh, improve your response in conjunction with medications. We can actually improve your uh, ejection fraction and your symptoms. If we have high blood pressure, we don't see as, as dramatic effects, although there's a very strong correlation between high blood pressure and sleep apnea. We usually get kind of subtle improvements in, in uh, treatment of high blood pressure, but if you have difficult to treat high blood pressure, it can become easier to treat. Um, and we know that if you have coronary artery disease or you've had a heart attack or stroke, you've had a heart surgery, your risk of having another event is reduced if we treat you for, uh, for sleep apnea. And another reason is also, is kind of related to the, uh, the fourth reason we see here, the accident risk and community safety, kind of rela related to the fatigue and diminished productivity. Um, if you have untreated sleep apnea, your risk of having a motor vehicle accident is several times higher than if you don't have sleep apnea. And there's actually studies that show that uh, a significant portion, if not a majority, 
of motor vehicle accidents are related to at least inadequate sleep. Now, that's not always sleep apnea. It can be just not getting enough sleep, but sleep apnea is a contributor and increases your risk of having an accident if you have untreated sleep apnea. So once somebody is suspected sleep apnea, either perhaps is a bed partner sends you in, you're sending yourself in because you feel crummy, your cardiologist or internal medicine doctor or neurologist or somebody has sent you in because you're having uh, you signed, you have a, a condition that they think could be uh, related to sleep apnea. We, we have to decide how we're going to diagnose it. So first thing, we talk about signs and symptoms. And we've already talked about several of those, being sleepy and being tired, snoring um, are a couple of the major ones. Uh, we'll take a sleep history. Are you getting enough sleep? Or is your bedroom conducive for sleep? Is it, is it a problem with not getting enough sleep that's causing some of your symptoms? And then we have to decide if we're going to do a, a, a test to determine if you have sleep apnea. There's two tests we have here. There's also a third test that sometimes we'll use. Uh, there's kind of the, the, the uh, most basic test is called an overnight oximetry. It's where you just wear a, a probe on your finger. Uh, usually a company will come and drop it off. You'll wear a probe on your finger overnight. It'll measure your oxygen levels. And if it shows that your oxygen levels are going up and down repeatedly quickly at night, that kind of makes us think that you might have sleep apnea. However, that test can't be used to confirm a diagnosis of sleep apnea. Nobody, uh, and what I mean by that is no insurance company will pay for treatment based on that. It just kind of makes you, it kind of reinforces your suspicion. And it's, it's a nice, inexpensive, easy test. It's not perfect. It's not, uh, if you really think you have sleep apnea, it's probably not the best test if you're strongly suspicious of it. But if you're, you're kind of on the border, it wouldn't be, a, you could, that's one test you can do to, to kind of, kind of uh, help maybe convince yourself that it's worth doing uh, more further testing. Uh, there's, there's two diagnostic tests that are listed here, the home sleep test and the nocturnal polysomnography. The nocturnal polysomnography, the bottom one, also known as a sleep study, is something that's actually done in a lab. It's called an attended sleep study, meaning you go into a uh, sleep center, it's, uh, you're going to sleep in your own private room, and there'll be an, a technologist who is trained in kind of putting the monitors on you, who will be in the next room, kind of in an adjacent room monitoring you. This is the gold standard. This is what's been used for 40 years to diagnose and treat sleep apnea. Um, it's when you go, and a lot of people are concerned when they go in for a test like this, they're like, how am I going to be able to sleep with all these wires? Most people sleep. It may not be the best night of sleep you've had, but most people are able to sleep during a sleep study, at least enough for us to get the information we need to diagnose you um, with sleep apnea uh, or, to ter or determine that you don't have sleep apnea. Um, the advantages of the study are that we can tell when you're asleep or not, and we can see if you have sleep apnea, uh, as opposed to, I'll talk about the home test, that really doesn't, for the most part, tell whether or not you're asleep. And knowing whether you're asleep or not helps us make the test more accurate. Um, it also, when you have a technologist there, that means that if any of the leads or anything falls off, we can put them back on, make sure that the test is uh, good quality and we're able to get the information that we need. Uh, the other advantage is that we can start therapy, and we'll talk a little bit, but there's one main therapy that we'll often use uh, on a study if, if uh, your physician asks us to uh, start therapy. If, you if we see sleep apnea uh, and your physician says, if you see sleep apnea, start therapy, we can actually get you started so we can get a pretty good idea of how you respond to therapy, if it works or not, uh, and I'm specifically speaking about CPAP therapy. We can find out the right settings or pressure, which we'll talk about in a little bit. So those are the advantages. The disadvantages, it's a night away from home, and it's also a more, it's a, a, a more expensive test than a home sleep test. So home sleep tests have been more common about the last 15 years or so, and that's kind of a light version of, a, uh, of an in-lab polysomnogram. And we don't do the brainwave monitoring, so for most of the studies, we can't accurately tell whether or not you're asleep. But we can tell with your, we can measure the respiratory events, we measure your oxygen levels. You usually have a device that's at least on your finger. Often it has bands around your chest and abdomen and a, can a cannula of some sort in your nose so we can measure where you're when, if you're moving air in and out and also if your chest, is, and chest and abdomen are moving. And those things in conjunction can, can help make the diagnosis of sleep apnea. It doesn't have a lot of these other leads, like the head leads and leg leads and, uh, and, uh, that are seen in, the, in the, uh, the in lab sleep study. The advantages of the home sleep test are you can do them at home and it's less expensive. 
The disadvantages are that you can't start therapy when you're on one of these uh, devices. Uh, one of the, when you're getting one of these tests, you can't get set started on CPAP that night to determine if it works and what the right settings are. Um, and also, if any of the leads fall off or it's not a good quality study, there's nobody there to, to put them back on if you're asleep and you don't know it. So we may not get, we are more likely to get a failed test that then has to be repeated. So once we work through uh, getting a test, we decide whether or not you have sleep apnea. So sleep apnea, what apnea means, apnea means is Greek for without breath. So it means you're holding your breath. And apnea means that while you're sleeping, you're having episodes where you're holding your breath. Usually it has to be for at least 10 seconds. Usually it's 10 to 30 seconds. So you hold your breath or you at least, or have a reduction in your breath. It doesn't have to be a complete stoppage of your breathing. It can just be a partial stoppage of your breathing, but your oxygen levels go down. It really looks like you're struggling a little bit. And uh, so that was, that's what we mean when we say you have, uh, apnea. It means you're stopping breathing repeatedly at night. And there's a couple of causes for that. Uh, one is central sleep apnea. That's actually the less common of the two, but we see it a fair amount here. So central sleep apnea means that the brain is not telling your body to sleep. So what we see in the polysomnography is we see that your chest and abdomen aren't moving, and there's no airflow moving at, uh, at your nose or mouth. So you're just laying there, just not even trying to breathe. And that's because your brain is not telling your body, you're telling your diaphragm and your chest muscles to breathe. And it's not that you don't breathe, uh, uh, you're not gonna breathe at all. What, really the way I look at it is that you're kind of over-breathing and under-breathing. You kind of hyperventilate, you take a couple, you'll, you'll, you'll stop breathing, and then you'll kind of catch up, take some catch-up breaths. And then you'll stop breathing again and take some catch-up breaths. So this is the less common form of sleep apnea. It's a little bit less studied too, so some of the correlations between central sleep apnea and cardiovascular disease aren't as strong as they are for obstructive sleep apnea. Um, nonetheless, we can see significant drops in oxygen levels, um, and the patients can definitely be quite symptomatic with this. If you were to look at the literature, um, this is not something that has nearly as much literature on it uh, as obstructive sleep apnea does, uh, because across the country, this is much less common. It's only a couple percent of all patients with uh, sleep apnea have central sleep apnea. It tends to occur commonly in patients who have heart failure, who have neurologic conditions, uh, and also take certain medications that suppress your breathing, like narcotics and opiates. However, it, this is, it's much more common at higher altitude than it is at sea level. So it's up here at this altitude, it's still not as common as obstructive sleep apnea, but it's a much bigger percentage. Close to about 20% of patients will have at least a component of central sleep apnea if they have sleep apnea. So we see quite a bit more of this. It can be a little bit more, the, the treatment options are a little bit different than the standard kind of pr protocols we will use for obstructive sleep apnea. So this can be, it's very treatable, but it often requires uh, 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 some different options in it, uh, than what, the, than than what will work for obstructive sleep apnea. So obstructive sleep apnea is the one you'll read and hear more about if, you just, if, you, if you're educating yourself about it and, and you're more likely to know people that have got this. So obstructive sleep apnea means as opposed to central, meaning central meaning the brain is, kind of the, is, is causing the problem by not having regular breaths. In obstructive sleep apnea, the problem is that your airway is obstructed. So here's a person laying sideways, kind of sliced up and Here's where air is supposed to be coming in, either through the nose or through the mouth, and it's supposed to come right back here, and then this is the tongue here, and this is the soft palate back here, the hard palate up front here and the soft palate. And there's supposed to be a, there's supposed to be a space here uh, along the back. This is the, this is the trachea where the air goes down into the lungs. This is the back of your nasopharynx. So the air is supposed to be able to come back down here or through your mouth through here and get here, but you can see in this, in this cartoon, you can see that the air, the, the, it's blocked because either a combination of either the tongue has fallen back for, for, uh, because of gravity, or the uh, soft palate has come back. And that, I said it's because of gravity, it's also because of tone. So when we fall, a, when we're awake, our airways are fairly open, but when we fall, when we lay back, uh, the airways get a little bit narrower, and they're actually maybe smaller than you might think when you're tr completely relaxed, even in a healthy person. The airway may be smaller than you might think, and just a little bit of a, a collapse in that airway can cause it to uh, completely, completely close off or just partially close off. It doesn't have to be completely closed off for you to have sleep apnea because you can have those um, partial stoppages in your breathing. We call them hypopneas or low breath, uh, where it's 
narrowed enough that it, you're struggling to breathe, your oxygen levels go down, you're often snoring at that time. Uh, but then, uh, and then what will happen is you'll wake up and you may not again remember that you woke up, but you'll, and this can happen hundreds of times, you'll wake up, you'll increase your muscle tone to the muscles that hold up the soft palate and the tongue, you'll pull those away from the back of the throat and you'll start to breathe again and you just go through that cycle over and over again. So about 20 million Americans uh, have got moderate to severe sleep apnea, even more have mild sleep apnea. The decision about whether you have to treat that, uh, there's stronger evidence that moderate to severe sleep apnea causes not just symptoms but cardiovascular mortality. Uh, there's even more patients that have mild sleep apnea. And some of those patients I treat, some of those I don't treat. It kind of depends. If you're symptomatic, it's probably more worth treating. Um, but if I have patients that are asymptomatic and have just mild sleep apnea, um, we may not treat them. And, we decide, we, we categorize sleep apnea by how many apneas and hypopneas you have per hour. We call that the apnea hypopnea index. So we, on one of these sleep studies, they count out how many times you stop breathing or have a partial stoppage in your breathing, meaning you have an apnea or a hypopnea. And then we look at how many of those you have per hour. And normal is less than five, mild would be five to 15, and uh, moderate is 15 to 30, and severe is over 30. I see patients that have over 100 per hour, so there's a very, very wide spectrum of, of, uh, of uh, the severity in that number. One of the things when I talk to patients is that it, that number is kind of a, simp a simplification. There's sometimes more to it than that, like, uh, and we have to take into account, like, I'll have some patients that'll have quite a few events, but their oxygen levels no never really drop that much. Um, but then I'll have other patients that don't have as many events, but they have severe oxygen desaturations. And, and, the, and the, the association with cardiovascular mortality is, is a combination of things. It's the number of events you have, and it's also the, how bad your oxygen levels uh, go down. Your, your brain, your tissues, your heart, they, they don't mind it actually that much if your oxygen levels tend to run a little bit low, but what they really don't like is if your oxygen levels go down and up and down and up, they don't have a steady kind of stream. They don't know if they're gonna be getting oxygen. Uh, and they don't know if you're going to keep stopping breathing, so they tend to release. Um, uh, the, you'll, you know, patients who have untreated sleep apnea have higher levels of cortisol, of adrenaline, just because their cells are kind of all struggling to know when the next, how much oxygen is going to be coming in the next minute or two. So the more, um, so, so it's not always a cut and dry thing that if you're, you have, you know, you're qualified as having obstructive sleep apnea, have six, you have an apnea hypopnea index of six per hour, you don't have to treat that. And just because I even have some patients that have an apnea hypopnea index that's a little less than five and they're symptomatic and I've treated them and they get, and they actually do feel a little bit better. You can imagine, I mean, having four times per hour that you may wake up and get stimulated may actually cause symptoms, but that's kind of uncommon. For the most part, we'll treat it would definitely, I really encourage people who have sleep apnea, who have apnea hypopnea indexes of over 15 to get treated. Five to 15 is um, some people we do, some people we don't. We look at other options and it depends again on symptoms. Um, so we've talk, I've kind of talked about, it's hard not to talk about sleep apnea and, and treatment unless, and uh, kind of the diagnosis unless we talk about um, the, one of the main treatments that most people who are interested and in, have read much or know people who have sleep apnea have talked about uh, PAP therapies. So PAP means positive airway pressure. So what that means is you remember that, that uh, cartoon we showed that shows the back of the airway uh, collapsing. Well, one of the ways we can do that is by applying pressure to the mouth and nose, uh, mouth or nose, or both of them. And by applying some pressure, we can kind of push those tissues apart. Now the, uh, so th you know, we use the term here PAP, positive airway pressure, I meaning it's a pressure more than atmospheric pressure. Um, the most common type is called CPAP, continuous positive airway pressure. That means it's the same pressure all along, whether you breathe in or out. There are also some other therapies like BiPAP, and that actually, the only difference there is that when you breathe in, it bumps the pressure up, and when you breathe out, it drops the pressure. It's still a PAP therapy. There's a further therapy called ASV that is a, a more advanced form of BiPAP that can be used to treat central sleep apnea. But all those fall into the, the CPAP therapies. You, for any of those, you'll have a box Next to your uh, bed, usually on your nightstand, that looks something like this. This is an older slide. This is about two kind of iterations um, earlier. So, uh, so, but you'll have a, a unit about that size sitting on the side uh, of your bed, and it'll be hooked up to a mask. You can, you can see right here, there's a tube, about a one inch tube, and it's hooked up to a mask. And the mask either fits over your nose um, or your nose and mouth, or it can fit under your nose, kind of like a snorkel fitting kind of under your nose. And which kind of mask you get is your choice. It's really all about comfort. 
For some people, they need one that covers the nose and mouth because they're a mouth breather. Um, sometimes mouth breathing is only because you have nasal congestion. If we treat that and we get positive airway pressure, sometimes you can do okay with just a nasal mask. So the CPAP unit applies positive pressure, keeps the airway from collapsing. Now, a couple uh, misconceptions some people have. Um, the machine isn't driving and forcing the air into you. Certainly a CPAP machine is not. A BiPAP machine does that a little bit, but for most patients, it's not, that's not a major component. You're still doing the breathing. It's not doing the breathing. It's expecting you to be breathing. It's just keeping the airway open so that when you try to breathe, the airway's open and so air can go in and out. The other is that this is just taking in room, it's just filtering and sucking in room air. It's not, um, it doesn't add oxygen to it unless we choose to add oxygen. If patients have low oxygen levels, we can add oxygen to the intake of this so it enriches the oxygen so you can treat with both CPAP and oxygen, but they're, they're really separate treatments. So most of my patients will fall into one or two categories. Either they love or they hate CPAP or PAP therapy, but I'll, I'll use the term CPAP. And, and if you talk to enough people who have got, uh, if you've got friends and family that have got it, you'll, you, your friends and family will fall into that, those categories as well. Um, I've got patients that say, how can you ever sleep with that thing? I could never do it. And there's a whole variety of people, reasons people don't, uh, don't tolerate it. It's, part of it's just it's uncomfortable. You know, wearing, it's the least sexy way to treat sleep apnea. I mean, you're you have to sleep with something, and you have to sleep with it every night. It's not a cure. I mean, once you are on this, unless you get another treatment that, that addresses your sleep apnea, you're going to be using this every night, all night, and preferably with naps. Anytime you sleep, when you travel, you should be using this therapy. Um, so, you know, a lot of some, so many people will uh, find that that's kind of difficult to tolerate. Although I have plenty of patients that, honestly, if I went to their house to say I was taking their CPAP machine, they'd meet me at the door with a shotgun because they love their CPAP because they sleep so much better with it. So that's uh, it's 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 maybe it's not the majority of my patients, but quite a few of them uh, will really just love their CPAP, and there's just no way they can sleep without it. Their life, their quality of life is so much better, and that's. One of the things that makes really, that's one of the more rewarding things I'll see. I've seen, I've seen patients who come to me for th this reason or even another reason and will, you know, like they'll come with me with a cough or shortness of breath or something, I'll address that, but also diagnose sleep apnea and get them treated. And a lot of times they didn't even realize how poorly they were sleeping, how poorly, they just thought they were just getting old, that's why they were tired all the time, they just thought that was how they were supposed to feel. We'll treat them, and it can be dramatic, dramatic effects in terms of improving their, their sleep and therefore improving their quality of life. Nonetheless, some people will have trouble with tolerating CPAP, um, and I, but I still, I get a lot of patients that have tried CPAP in the past, they didn't like it, they're seeing me five or 10 years later because somebody's kind of told them the, that they need to kind of get this readdressed. And we can often work through, and I can get a fair number of those patients to at least tolerate CPAP. Um, maybe not love it, but at least tolerate it. And part of that's education, like explaining to them why they should uh, use CPAP. Kind of some of the things we talked about before, like, oh, you have, atrial, you have heart failure of atrial fibrillation, and you want to try to treat that. I can help, I, I'll tell patients often, I might, part of my job is to make your, your, the cardiologist's job easier and make them more successful, is that if I can t treat this untreated sleep apnea, I can make it more likely that they can treat your high blood pressure, your heart failure, your pulmonary hypertension, um, your atrial fibrillation, and maybe keep you from having another heart attack. So once patients understand that, it kind of makes them invest a little bit more. They're willing to kind of, I'll say, suffer a little bit more with CPAP. Uh, but also, sometimes it's just they had the wrong pressure settings. They didn't know how to use their humidifier. There's a, you know, really part of it is just asking, why can't you tolerate CPAP? Is it is it the mask didn't fit right? Is it leaked? Is it the pressure was too high? The pressure was too low? The humidifier, you know, it was too dry. And a lot of those problems have solutions. They may not work for everybody, but a lot of this is the times we can kind of work through the intolerance and, and come up with at least a better, if not a perfect, solution for helping you tolerate CPAP. Um, the reason that CPAP is, for many patients, the first line of, uh, 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 of treatment is because it's highly effective. So 90% chance or so that if you can tolerate CPAP, that I can, treat your sleep, I can treat your sleep apnea, and, or I'll say 85, 90%, that I can effectively treat your sleep apnea and make it so that you have a normal or near normal um, AHI, basically meaning your, your sleep, sleep apnea is effectively treated. Um, and if, it's not, if CPAP doesn't work, sometimes if it's just BiPAP, if you have central sleep apnea, it's often ASV, which is, a, uh, which is as I said, a kind of a version of BiPAP that can be very effective for central sleep apnea. So and if we take all those together, 
80, 90 percent, or I'm sorry, 85, 90 percent probably of patients with obstructive or central sleep apnea can respond to CPAP or ASV or BiPAP, one of those therapies, if, we, uh, if they can tolerate it. And, and the majority of people can tolerate it if, I, if we kind of work with them. Um, next form of therapy I'd like to talk about is oral appliances. So it's a, an oral appliance is a custom mouthpiece that's intended to pull the jaw forward during sleep. And so you can see this from this, this top um, picture here. Here's a, uh, in, in a kind of a model version of it. It's kind of like the devices that people will use when they have uh, grinding, the, the bite guards, but it's much more robust. It's thicker. This isn't like a thin little flimsy plastic. This is kind of a hard acrylic. It's a little bit thicker. And it comes in two parts. You see there's a part on the upper and there's a part on the lower. And then between them, there's some kind of retainer or a pin that pulls the lower jaw forward, or keeps the lower jaw forward in relation to the upper jaw. So the way you would do this is you'd get this fit, and then you usually kind of gradually work the, uh, uh, will it make adjustments by putting more, you know, stronger elastomer bands or little pins to pull the lower jaw forward when you sleep. So you'll end up sleeping kind of with your jaw pulled forward about, it, and basically you just kind of adjust it until it's as, as far forward as you can do it comfortably. And in doing that, by pulling the jaw forward, you pull the tongue forward, and so some of the tissues associated with, with the soft palate, and that opens up this airway here. Um, I think, I usually think of there's, there's kind of three levels of these devices you can get. One is the boil and bite ones, which you may have had from sports, where you may just put it in hot water, you put it in your teeth, and you kind of bite down on it, you're supposed to adjust your jaw position. Those cost $100 or so. They can work, um, but they're the le least likely to work, and if people tr want to try those because they want to save money, and they find that they don't work, I say, just because that doesn't work doesn't mean an oral appliance at work won't work. It just means the cheapest one won't work. The next level is to go to your dentist um, and ask your dentist about it. Um, dentists will often will fabricate something like this. They usually cost, I'd say, $500, $800 or so to fabricate one of these. It's kind of like a mini version of braces. It's not just how you get it made right there. They have to take molds, send them off, get them fabricated, come back, get them adjusted. And uh, you know, though, usually the, the, typically with um, patients who go to and see their regular dentist for these, the dentist may or may not have a lot of experience in these. It may be something where they know a little bit about it, may know a fair amount, but they, um, they also usually will not char bill your medical insurance for this, so usually you're paying out-of-pocket cash for this. It's not usually covered by dental insurance, so you're usually going to pay cash for this. Um, the uh, level that I usually refer patients for is a dentist that specializes in oral appliances. This is somebody that really has taken an interest in dental sleep medicine, and that, that's a thing, it's dental sleep medicine. Um, that's a major part of their practice, and they, as a key, they usually will accept, they accept um, medical insurance, they accept, accept your medical insurance, because this is a medical device, so they're a dentist that will have medical, sleep, medical contra um, uh, contracts so they can get the cost of this covered. The cost is usually quite a bit more, though, so if you have a high deductible or copay, it could be, these can be several thousand dollars, uh, but again, this could be run through your medical insurance. These are most effective for patients that have, my, the less severe your sleep apnea, the more likely these are be to, to, are to be effective. I usually wouldn't recommend these for somebody who has severe sleep apnea. Um, uh, usually we recommend it for people that have mild to moderate. The advantage is that it's a lot, it, for most patients, it's more comfortable than having a CPAP every night. It's easier to transport, easier to take travel, I, tra traveling. I have some patients that have a CPAP at home. They'll use this when they travel. They know it might not be quite as good, but they'll use it for travel. Um, the, uh, and then another limitation also is that usually I would want to do a repeat sleep study to determine how effective this is because these are better at making your snoring go away than at making your sleep apnea go away. Um, this is in distinction from um, CPAP where we don't usually need to do a follow-up sleep study because the CPAP machine itself has got uh, sensors that can measure whether you're breathing, measure whether you're having sleep apnea. So routinely when I set up someone with CPAP, I'll see them back and I'll get a report from the machine that will tell me the sleep apnea is well treated or, and if it's not, then we adjust the machine and if we can't, then we may try a different device or I may have to have you go back to the lab. But often, for most patients, they don't need to go back to the lab once we have you on CPAP. For an oral appliance, I would recommend that people go back to the lab so we know whether, or have a sleep study at home so they know whether or not it's effective. This also won't work uh, for some patients that have uh, poor dentition, have TMJ problems. Uh, those can be limitations as well. Last thing I want to talk about is positional therapy, and that's where you wear, a device, you wear something to try to keep yourself from sleeping on your back, because in about half of patients, your sleep apnea is worse when you're on your back 
than it is when you're on your side or you're sleeping on your stomach. And so I'll, uh, some patients I'll see and they'll have, usually it's mild or moderate sleep apnea on their, on their back, but if they're on their sides, they're either normal or very mild. And we'll talk about that as a treatment option alone, not having to wear CPAP, not having to get an oral appliance. It's relatively simple if people can do it. And a lot of people say, well, how am I going to not sleep on my back? Uh, there's a variety of ways. The simple low budget way is just get a t-shirt, uh, put some, sew a pocket in the back, put some tennis balls or wiffle balls in it. And then when you lay on your back, you'll kind of be, it'll kind of remind you to wake you up. It's kind of like the equivalent of the spouse, the bed partner elbow in the, in, the, in the back. And it'll remind you to get on your side. And those can be fairly effective. There's, uh, there's, a, here's a, there's a whole variety of commercially available devices like this one that are a little, this is a little bit bigger bolster. Um, that really will keep you from sleeping on your back much more effectively. Uh, there's a couple devices here. This is actually like a little small. It's about, uh, well, I'd say, a third the size of a smartphone, and it, and it sits on a collar around your neck, and it will uh, vibrate like your phone does if you lay on your back. Um, I have a few people that try that if they really want to kind of geek out, but uh, don't don't use those too often. The disadvantage is, you know, if you don't wear, if you don't, if you don't, you only have the advantage of the therapy if you do learn and train yourself to sleep on your back, uh, on your sides, and not on your back. And if you're one of those patients for which this form of therapy is uh, effective, you're somebody that doesn't have sleep apnea on your uh, on your sides, but does if you're on your back. The fourth uh, kind of category of treatment is surgical options, and for that, I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Mark Hunter to talk about surgical options for obstructive sleep apnea. throat surgeon who does uh, have a longer history of sleep apnea surgery and uh, as an ear, nose, and throat doctor, uh, we've in the past done a significant amount of treatment for sleep apnea and really the, the pulmonary groups and the neurology groups have really jumped in and done a phenomenal job of managing that um, and have managed all of those therapies and all those diagnoses that we've seen Dr. Minor talk about, but in the end, sometimes those don't get us there uh, for some people. And we talk about CPAP intolerance, and we talk about uh, issues with positioning and so forth. And so, you know, there's a long history of surgical treatments for snoring. Long before we ever figured out there was, was sleep apnea, there was snoring. And long before CPAP devices, we tried to get those obstructions out of the way so people could make less noise. And a lot of that had to do with altering anatomy so we could remove the obstructions, say, in the nose or in the throat uh, or even in the mouth. Starting with, you know, we'll go top down. Starting with the nose, well, if you can't breathe well through your nose, a lot of people then have to breathe through their mouths. That makes often snoring a lot worse. Um, it also makes people sleep poorly often and have other issues with that. In our modern day times, now that we have CPAP, the other thing that we've found is, well, no, we can't cure sleep apnea with a nose surgery uh, or opening up the nose, but a lot of people do not tolerate their CPAP because their noses are obstructed. And so that's a fair portion of what I do is I deal with people with nasal obstruction, be that a septal deviation where the septum is bent and blocking the airway, or turbinates, uh, there's turbinates in the nose that puff up and puff down and, and cause certain problems. Uh, and then also people, some people, when they breathe in, their nostrils collapse. And so we deal with all those sorts of things uh, still, and especially in the setting of CPAP intolerance, because we found that's fairly effective to get people breathing in there. You also talk about the oral advancement devices or the jaw advancement advice devices, and people often can't tolerate those very well if they can't breathe through their nose or having to open their mouth and make things less effective. Working our way down, you know, we talk about big tonsils and the soft palate and the obstruction back there that Dr. Miner was showing you with the soft palate. Those, we've been doing those surgeries for, again, decades. Um, and those were very popular until CPAP came along. As Dr. Miner mentioned, CPAP is, if you can tolerate it, a very reliable way of treating sleep apnea, where we found that some people significantly improved with a procedure called a U-triple-P, where we modify the soft palate, remove the tonsils, and make more space. It's not as predictable as a result. Um, and we have ways of predicting that now that are statistically better proven, 
so we know who are good patients and who are not good patients for that, and so we take a peek at that anatomy. Um, but still, I would say somewhat less predictable and certainly less comfortable than CPAP. But that discomfort after surgery only lasts a certain amount of time. CPAP is forever. Um, looking at the back of the tongue and the front of the tongue, there's issues with, with how we can move the tongue around because the tongue is a big part of that obstruction. Um, you'll be one of the 0.001% of humans that know that there's actually a tonsil on the back of the tongue, now that I've told you that. Uh, so yeah, we have a lingual tonsil back there. If you say, oh, well, I've had my tonsils out, I'll guarantee 99.5% of you who have your tonsils out have not had your lingual tonsil removed. Um, that's, only, that's one of those procedures that only a few of us sleep apnea surgeons do. Um, and when they say you're talking, getting your tonsils out, they're talking about the ones back in the back of your throat here. We call those the palatine tonsils, not the lingual tonsils. So that's sometimes a culprit, and we still, I still take those out sometimes and deal with that. Um, the throat, there's a plethora of things we do with the throat. There's a little bone down here called the hyoid, and if we bring the hyoid up and position it forward, all of a sudden you can actually make more space back there. We go to extremes where we can actually disarticulate the upper jaw, part of the maxilla, and the lower jaw and pull them forward. Interestingly, that's the only surgery that we've shown to be as effective as CPAP. However, it's a pretty major surgery and it changes a lot of stuff and not many people are willing to go through that. So there's some limitations with those in terms of predictability that we've, we've gone to remove those obstacles. From there, there's a whole sort of new category of, of procedures we talk about. Um, and probably the most popular one we'll spend a bit of time on because that's one of the newest ones on the scene. It's called a hypoglossal nerve stimulator where we're not actually modifying the anatomy so much as we're making it move around to get out of the way. And in this picture you'll see Right down here, there's a device that we put into the chest. It's a relative of the pacemaker. Pacemakers have been around for decades now. Well, this is a similar kind of electronics and similar kind of battery to that, but not really because it has nothing to do with the heart. What it does is it helps you in terms of breathing at night because what it does is you have a breathing sensor you can see down here in the lower chest, and I'll talk about that. That breathing sensor, sits between the ribs and every time you go to breathe in, it activates this little computer device. After it activates that computer device, another little lead up on a nerve called the hypoglossal nerve positions the tongue forward and lifts the soft palate a bit. Pretty clever because it's doing exactly what you do while you're awake is it keeps that airway open for you to breathe. Even if you're laying on your back, on your side, whatever else, it's usually very, very effective at pulling that forward and opening it up every time you try to breathe at night. Well, let's talk more about this. Um, there's only certain people who are qualified to get this sort of procedure done. You have to have moderate to severe sleep apnea, so you rely on Dr. Minor or myself to look at your sleep study and say, okay, are you that right person? Um, if you're unable to get consistent benefit from CPAP, so you don't tolerate it, or you know, you're like one of my patients who has a FEMA person who worked with FEMA, well, they go to work sites where there's no electricity. You can't do CPAP without electricity, especially for prolonged periods of time. Um, you can't be significantly overweight. We talk about it usually for most insurance companies, and for, the, for this to be effective, we talk about having a BMI of less than 35. Uh, you can talk about that with me or with your primary care doc if you want. Uh, you have to pass an airway anatomy exam. That's something we have to do actually while you're, while you're snoring, and I can do that with the help of a little anesthesia, and we can see how your palate moves while you sleep to see if you're a good candidate. And currently in the United States, in the United States, you have to be over the age of 18. Uh, the procedure itself is outpatient procedure. Uh, there's people who are faster and slow at it. Um, I take two to, two, two to three hours with this. I never rush, but I make sure we do a great job with it. Um, and it uh, usually goes very, very smoothly. And after the procedure, the whole idea is, well, you have a little remote control, kind of looks like a, a computer mouse, and you can press a button and go to sleep. And we'll talk about this here. Here's this guy, he's going to bed. He's already had his implant. And he grabs his remote, brings it over his chest where the implant is done. 
activates it, and then all of a sudden that breathing sensor activates, it opens the airway, and you can see the tongue up there move as it goes back and forth. Um, pretty slick, kind of wish I thought of it myself, it makes a lot of sense. So it moves the tongue forward, can lift the soft palate a little, little bit on a lot of people, and all of a sudden you can get some air through there. Um, and again, it's not a dramatic movement of the tongue in most people, it's kind of like the movement of the tongue you'd have as you're awake here. The procedure itself used to be three incisions. That's why I crossed that out there and put two small incisions. We do an incision under the chin, an incision in the upper chest, and we're done. Uh, fairly quick recovery. Within a week or two, you're back to regular activities for the most part. Um, not a real painful recovery for most people. A lot of my patients say, oh, I use just Tylenol, maybe a little Advil for it. Uh, whereas our Implants for our uh, for for your pacemakers. Those pacemakers, the batteries go out every two to three years. This battery lasts about 11 years. With either of these, all we do is a brief procedure where we take it out, put in a new one, and we're good to go. I joke that in 11 years it'll probably be the size of a nickel, so it won't be a big deal anyway. Uh, and here's a new thing about it. There's a common question: Is can I still get an MRI? Because that's been a limitation in the past, and actually. Just recently, the FDA approved Inspire implants for full body MRI, whereas in the past, when it wasn't as fully studied, you could only do extremities and so forth. Now it's fully approved. And so what happens when you after, after you have it done? Well, you recover for a while. We usually give you a month for everything to heal in place. And you go see the clinic, and you get it turned on for the first time. And the doc will usually have a device that can turn on the device through the skin, kind of emits a signal through the skin and can read the device. And you'll see them doing it there. And they check and make sure that it's effective. They make sure that it's working right. And then they spend a good amount of time teaching you how to use the remote control. The remote's pretty simple. You press a green button and that green button turns it on when you go to bed. It's usually set to stay on about seven hours. After about seven hours, it'll turn off. If you wake up at six hours and 59 minutes, well, you just take the remote control and press the button, you can turn it off. Um, there's also a way that if you get up in the middle of the night and have to go let the dog out, you can actually wake up and pause it. It'll pause for 20, 30 minutes, whatever it's preset for, and then you can go back to bed and it'll turn itself on after that period of time. Uh, pretty slick, works pretty well. All you need is AA batteries until 11 years expires and then you need to put that new device in. Uh, you can carry that remote with you anywhere and if you lose it, you can always get another one. So, how does it work? Well, it's actually proven quite well. You get about an 80% reduction in your AHI. That's that number Dr. Miner was talking about of your events per hour. Um, for most people, that's plenty. From, oh, this is important. Talking about bed partner reported snoring, I can guarantee you this is less painful and cheaper than divorce. That's what we joke about all the time, that this is a much, much preferred option for this. We get an 88% reduction in snoring. Um, and so after Inspire, only 10% of bed partners complain about this. So I have a lot of patients who say, yeah, all of a sudden they're back for better or for worse, maybe back in the same bed as their, as their spouse after all of this. Um, but it works out really nicely in that direction. Patients like it, where there's a national overall estimate of maybe 50% of people don't tolerate CPAP. All of a sudden we see here that 94% of people tolerate the Inspire implant and do quite well with it. Speaking of doing quite well with it, what speaks to it nicely is that people use it for an average of about six hours a night when you look across all comers. So that's pretty slick that way. Uh, and does it work? Well, we have a ton of studies now. I mean, I think worldwide there's probably been 25,000 of these implanted, last I heard. So that's quite a few, and they've been quite effective and not had significant problems with them. Uh, so it's studied quite extensively. Uh, the coverage now, you know, since I started doing them a number of years ago, the coverage now is quite, e quite friendly. You can get Medicare to cover it, you VA policies cover it. Uh, almost all insurances cover it. We typically don't have a problem with that anymore. And then that's it. So these are the things we've covered. We've talked about, Dr. Miner talked about the diagnosis of sleep apnea, the types of sleep apnea, some of our typical treatments, including non-surgical and then some of the surgical things we can do to help stuff out. 
Um, and then that's sort of beyond the anatomic issues, we talk about, you know, the hypoglossal nerve stimulation. And I think right now we'd like to open it up for questions. I think you're able to input those on your computer if you want to try to do that. Here's our contact information. And uh, we'll see if you have any questions. If we get bored and don't have any questions to answer, I do have a little video that they did a, a review of it on CBS, but hopefully we have enough questions we don't have to torture ourselves with that. Thank you very much. We do have some questions, so I'm just going to jump right in here. Please remind us, how is weight loss an effective therapy for some people? Sure. Um, we, we, one of the things I didn't mention was that you know, we think of uh, uh, obesity as often associated with sleep apnea, and it is strongly associated. However, um, many patients uh, you don't have to be obese to have sleep apnea. About 30% of patients who have sleep apnea are not actually obese. But for the patients that are obese, weight loss can help. It's not very likely to, to cure it, and it's also not as likely to be a sustained cure, partly because the tissues may have already stretched because of obesity. You know, the extra, excess tissues here may have stretched. They may sh uh, shrink down, but then over time, often these patients will develop their, uh, their sleep apnea will kind of creep back up on them again. So it's, I certainly strongly encourage my patients to, to, to lose weight. Um, I've sent several patients to even bariatric surgery. The best studies have been with bariatric surgery because in studies in which you just tell people to lose weight, there's usually not enough l weight loss and sustained weight loss to be able to do sleep studies and show that people have gotten better. But in studies where people have bariatric surgery and have, had, have started off you know, usually very obese, had dr significant weight losses, we usually will see the sleep apnea get significantly better, but not often that it, it's not often that it cures it. It can make it so that it's easier to treat, like maybe you're now a candidate for a therapy that, uh, um, you know, if you had severe sleep apnea, now it's mild to moderate. Now you're a, a candidate for another therapy, or your CPAP pressures are lower, they're easy to tolerate. So those are the, uh, you know, those are the things I, I, I tell my patients, you know, please lose weight for this and a lot of other reasons, um, but don't expect it to cure. I've only had, I think, two or three patients that have really been cured of their sleep apnea by significant sustained weight loss. Okay. Is it safe to use prescription or over-the-counter sleep aids like Ambien, melatonin, et cetera, if you have treated CPAP um, sleep apnea? Yes, and even if you don't have treated sleep apnea, those don't uh, worsen your sleep apnea. Okay. Is it safe to use sleep aids if you use a CPAP? Yes. What is a good and a not good oxygen level? You know, there's not a run simple answer for that. You know, one, one thing I didn't mention here is that some people ask, hey, why, why can't I just go on oxygen instead of CPAP? And oxygen only treats part of the problem. Like if you have those low oxygen levels, it only treats part of the problem. It treats the low oxygen levels, but it doesn't stop you from having the obstructive sleep apnea. It can treat central. Um, but it doesn't stop the obstructives. And the obstructive, if you're still stopping breathing, that still causes you to release the adrenaline and the cortisol levels, and it's still stress on your body. Um, there's not a good number, and you'll get different opinions from different people. Uh, generally, we like to see patients' oxygen levels above 89 to 90% would be considered a kind of a normal, relatively healthy, probably everybody's, you know, your cells are all probably pretty happy at that level. It gets kind of wishy-washy, you know, if you're, well, if you're 88 and a half or you're averaging 90 but you spend 20 minutes between 87 and 80, you know, how, how concerned, how much of a concern is that? And it really depends on the patient. We kind of talk about your risk factors for that. The lower, you know, kind of the, low, the lower it is and the more time it spends lower, I'd say below the upper 80s, um, then I think the imperative for addressing that, correcting that with treating with sleep, with treating the CPAP or putting you on oxygen, it just becomes a stronger imperative to do that. Your, your body certainly doesn't like oxygen levels in the low 80s. The, um, the, the, the data is pro probably 85 is a good level to say it really shouldn't be below that. And I, mean, I have some patients that they hang out, you know, on their CPAP, they hang out with oxygen levels of 87 percent. They're pretty happy with it. They feel okay. They don't have pulmonary hypertension or, uh, or, or haven't had a history of strokes or things. And some for, the, for those patients, often the hassle of getting oxygen and using it and the expense of it is not worth it. So I kind of, it's kind of a, is it really, is it worth it to go on oxygen for those patients that are kind of in the upper 80s? Great. 
Great. Does using the CPAP shorten your lifespan when you use it um, or even cause dementia? Using CPAP does not. Using CPAP, uh, we know that untreated sleep apnea is associated, there are studies that have shown that, use, that untreated sleep apnea is associated with increased mortality and treating, this, and treating your sleep apnea uh, will, reduce that, uh, will reduce that risk of you know, the heart, heart attack, strokes, things we've talked about. So no, there's no, the sleep, using sleep ap, uh, CPAP or any of those PAP therapies or, treat, or any of the treatments for sleep apnea that we talked about would not shorten your life. Okay. For the appliances, will it move your teeth, cause uh, TMJ, and change your jaw? It can. It can certainly move your teeth, and it can cause TMJ. And that's why I'd lean towards seeing a, a, seeing a dentist who specializes in this. Uh, you can certainly get tooth you can certainly get tooth movement, so they need to keep track of your gaps and your occlusion. Um, TMJ. If you get into TMJ problems, that could be a, as people who've had that know that could be a that can be a, a real a real kind of become a chronic health problem. So that's why I prefer uh, to work with dentists who have a lot of experience in this. This person is a retired sleep technologist and just recently heard about sleep apnea and nocturnia. Mm -hmm. Any input on that? So I guess sometimes patients sent because they have nocturia. I mean, nocturia meaning you, have, you get up and go to the bathroom, and that can be normal. But it, as you get to having more frequent uh, episodes, um, that can be bothersome. And there is there are some kind of weak associations between untreated sleep apnea and that. Um, and there was even there was a study I saw once where they took they had they were doing the sleep study, and they could see that the patient had sleep apnea and woke up because of sleep apnea, but then they woke up and then they pressed the button and said, hey, I have to go to the bathroom. So that person probably would not, they, they may have waited another 20, 30 minutes. They may have still had to go to the bathroom, but they may have made it longer uh, if they hadn't woken up because of the sleep apnea. They thought they had woke up because they had to go to the bathroom, but really it was because they had sleep apnea. So sometimes uh, treating sleep apnea can help people stay asleep longer, reduce the frequency of getting up and going to the bathroom at night. How likely are false positive results in a home sleep study? Though that would be relatively unlikely. You can have uh, false negatives if you were awake for a lot of the studies. So if you know you have sleep apnea for uh, if you if you are awake half the time, uh, so you're, then you're not having any sleep apnea at all, uh, and then you go to you only sleep for a, for a half of it. You're only going to have half the number of events that you would normally have in a full night's sleep. So it will underestimate the severity of the sleep apnea. You certainly could have uh, false positives if you just had a, but more likely it would be just that that particular night you had more sleep apnea. So if you were to do a sleep study, say, 10 nights in a row, uh, which isn't something we would ever usually do, but you could be somebody who's on the borderline, and some of those nights might be positive because you slept on your back more, you had a few more drinks, or you had more REM sleep, which is a time when we tend to have more sleep apnea, and other nights you had less. But the, the, the device is itself, so you may have some variability night to night, um, but the device actually mis misrepresenting and saying you had sleep apnea when you didn't, you, that's really not something that we see. Okay. How does a severely deviated septum contribute to apnea? I can speak to that a little bit. I mean, you probably see quite a bit. Of it. Um, one of the things we think about, well, one of the ways I explain it, I'll turn sideways. Your jaw hinges here, over on the side of your face. It doesn't hinge up here or back here. And what that does is as you're having to, I'll get to the septum part, I promise. As your jaw has to open while you're sleeping, if you're having to mouth breathe, all of a sudden the jaw drops down and back if you think about where it's hinged. So it doesn't just open down, everything opens back. Your tongue muscles are all attached right under here in your chin. Your throat muscles, many, many of them that support the throat, are attached under here, under the chin. And so all of a sudden, if this jaw is opening down and back, which it does, and you're having to open your mouth to breathe, all of a sudden it pulls the tongue and a lot of the throat tissues back. And so if you're not able to breathe through your nose, you're going to be opening your mouth. So if we can actually get you breathing better through your nose and get you to sleep, and sometimes we have to train people to sleep with their mouths closed, um, but if we can get that mouth closed, all of a sudden it really opens up the airway and back and really helps people tolerate, A, snore less, 
I would rarely, rarely ever see anybody cure their sleep apnea with that procedure though, with opening up the nose and curing that. You can maybe get a little change in the AHI number. You can certainly get a better quality of sleep, better quality of exercise, better quality of allergy tolerance, on and on and on with breathing through your nose. But mostly we do it at this point in terms of sleep apnea to help CPAP compliance or help jaw mandibular advancement compliance. And so that's where that big connection is with the septum and the turbinates and the nasal valve collapse that I deal with a lot. Uh, this person has used a CPAP for about four and a half years. They're saying that they sleep less and they're waking up at 3 a.m. Any comments on that? Uh, that, that's a complicated, I'd have to talk to the patient about it a little bit, about whether their sleep issues before, why are they waking up so early with CPAP. But I certainly, you know, it could be they're getting better quality sleep. Maybe there's somebody who only needs, needs five hours of good sleep, which is not very common. Maybe there's somebody that needs less good quality sleep, so maybe they were sleeping seven hours to get five hours of good sleep now. That's a possibility, but I'd have to talk to the person to, to kind of really find out why. There are some people that I won't, I, you know, I won't, uh, I won't lie to them about it. You know, some people just don't sleep as well with CPAP. They're just disturbed by the tubing. They're disturbed by having something on their face. They don't like the, you know, just being kind of tied down to something. So there's some people that you, know, you have to have that hard conversation. Is it worth the hassle? And the, it, it can disrupt your sleep if you're just not somebody that likes having an alien strapped on your face at night. If you tolerate CPAP, can you still get the implant so you don't have to rely on the machine? We talk about that. I mean, it's because it's, it's it does. It sounds like a much more friendly way of sleeping is just having a little remote control. Um, and what we talk about is, are you having consistent benefit from it? And where that consistent benefit comes from is using the CPAP. Uh, the people who have difficulty with it are not just people who have, you know, claustrophobia or concerns or PTSD or something like that or don't want that thing on their face. Some people aren't tolerating it because they travel so much or like, you know, my one patient goes to FEMA sites or they hunt or they camp and all these sorts of things. So there is part of that that we see. Um, but currently insurance companies will not back paying for a C or paying for the Inspire implant unless we have a, a good documentation of what's going on with the CPAP and why it's not appropriate for them. So that leads me to how much is a CPAP and is that covered by insurance? Yeah, CPAP will be covered by insurance. In order to get covered, we have to do a whole set of steps. Um, you, have to have, you have to have a face-to-face -face visit with a, uh, with a provider who says, I think you have sleep apnea. You have to have a sleep study. And then you have to get put on the CPAP. And then for most insurances, you have to demonstrate that you're using it. They'll usually rent it. And then, they'll, um, and then once you've demonstrated that you've used it, uh, then they'll, pay, they'll basically buy it for you and pay, pay for the whole cost. And if you go, it was part of the question the cost of it? Yeah, so if you, it de and it depends. If you go through it, your insurance will usually have a DME provider, a local company that will provide the device, do the masks and the fittings and things like that. And that's usually a few thousand dollars uh, for the whole cost of having the device, having the support that they do, and having the mask. Um, some people who just kind of want to do it on their own, they don't want to get into the copay. And there, uh, pre-pandemic, you could get a good unit, uh, kind of the, the unit's got all the bells and whistles that I would usually, usually want um, for around $800. And then you have to buy masks at, the mask frames are 100 or so, and the inserts are another 50 or so. Um, and you have to tubing, so a couple of the little expenses. But now, after the, now with the pandemic, the supply's a lot tighter, and so mostly I'm seeing them around $1,000 or so. So and I'll have some patients that will just buy a second one. They'll have one at their, you know, they'll have one that they use for travel or they'll have one that they keep at their second home or something like that, uh, and they'll pay cash. And you can get those on Amazon or CPAP.com. So around $1,000 or so for a device, but usually through your insurance and all the support and things like that, um, you're usually paying uh, uh, close to twice that. And then BiPAP and ASV are quite a bit more expensive than either of those. Okay. So we have time for about one, maybe two more questions here. Okay. Um, there's quite a few people that are asking about altitude. Mm -hmm. um, some are saying if I move down lower to uh, lower altitude, am I going to have better results just naturally uh, with sleep apnea? We have one uh, person here that moved here about 10 months ago 
and they're feeling that with the increased uh, altitude that they need some adjustment to their machines. Can you comment on that, please? Sure. Um, so altitude will definitely affect central sleep apnea. And sometimes it's not as easy as cut and dried as you might think, and as, as, as cut and dried as I might think, looking at a sleep study, whether it's exclusively obstructive sleep apnea or exclusively central sleep apnea. Uh, so you know, sometimes what I'm calling obstructive, there may be a component of central. That definitely will get wor can get worse as we get up on higher in altitude. I have, I have a couple patients, and I can't explain this, who up here they have what clearly looks like obstructive sleep apnea to me, to me and they go, their snowbird go down to Arizona and their sleep apnea is dramatically better or, or completely better. That's, but that's pretty uncommon. The obstructive part is as we went over, it's what you're, the anatomy in the back of your throat and not really affected much by the altitude. And was there another part to that question as well? Um, uh, mainly just about changes in altitude yeah. and you know if you move from one way to the other or vice versa uh, if you're going to have to uh, change your machines or the oh, yeah that so some of the machines you need to make sure that your machine is rated for altitude if it's up here most of them are they have and now they have auto uh, most of the ones no at least all the ones that we that are delivered here all have got uh, altitude adjustments are kind of built into them um, but it's possible if you brought one from sea level, especially an older one, they may not be rated to go. Usually they can handle this altitude if you're going up into the mountains, like over 8,000 feet. Uh, there's some CPAP devices that are just, the, the pressure sensors, the flow sensors just aren't designed to work at that altitude. But that's not, not too common. Okay. Uh, can you speak about sleep apnea in children and teens? Sure. You want to talk about that? That's actually a little more, of, a little more of an ENT it problem. It is a little usually. bit more of an ENT problem, interestingly. Um, and and it's, it's a big subject, so I, you know, I'll touch on it briefly. The algorithm, how we treat it, tends to be very different. Once upon a time when I was in training, we gave all sorts of kids sleep studies. And we did tons and tons of sleep studies. And you can imagine a lot of kids aren't going to tolerate going to a foreign room with cameras, you know, leads connected to them and so forth and get very much sleep. Some just don't tolerate it at all. Um, so that was difficult, but it, one of the things that we did find out is that when we're looking at kids, we're not looking typically at cardiac change or pulmonary or brain changes. We're looking at neurodevelopmental, which I guess is a brain thing, but that neurodevelopmental stuff was really affected by sleep apnea in kids. And nobody could quite figure out where we see in adults, you know, at five, events or less per hour, we consider that normal. Well, in kids, we even saw down to one event per hour causing neurodevelopmental changes. And it got to be very difficult, especially just using a sleep study to try to address you know, that sort of need. And in the end, what we found out is if we have a certain set of symptoms, common symptoms in kids would be a lot like adults, maybe some daytime sleepiness, maybe napping before they need to, waking up grumpy and tired, which oh, we think all kids do. No, not all kids don't do that. Uh, bedwetting, uh, ADHD symptoms, or possible diagnosis of ADHD, all those things and others lead us to then check off these boxes and then along with an exam can say, oh wait, yes, you likely have sleep apnea. Um, and one of the reasons we've stopped doing those sleep studies so much is we looked and all of a sudden, I think it was something about 96% of kids who exhibited this number of symptoms when we go down the list had sleep apnea anyway. So all of a sudden, if we exhibit those symptoms, why put them through this difficult sleep study when we know that they're, they're gonna have it anyway? Um, the treatment pathway is very different. We don't typically jump to CPAP with kids, where with adults, we typically jump to CPAP. With kids, what we found is extremely effective is we still take out tonsils. And we have great data on taking out tonsils, both big and surprisingly to me, great studies showing that even small tonsils, the post-surgical remodeling of the palate and the throat really actually open things up and help them. And then there's a number of other treatments, but it's, it's a, it's a moderately complex field, but it kind of requires an ear, nose, and throat surgeon who does a lot of this sleep stuff to take a look at that and sort of help out. And pediatricians are usually fairly versed in it, and these guys, of course, uh, do quite a bit of that pediatric sleep apnea as well. One thing I'd add to that you kind of touched on, but kids, the symptoms are often different than they are in adults. Yeah. 
and in particular, you mentioned ADHD, and I think really any kid that's being diagnosed with ADHD, I think at least the thought should be when, in the parent and bringing to a provider, could this be sleep apnea? And that can be like looking in the back of the throat, could it be tonsils, because yeah. um, there's studies that show that ADHD plus large tonsils take the tonsils out, and ADHD in a large percent, a, a good percentage of those, I think it's close to 50%, the yeah. ADHD got better. So now you're avoiding a, a diagnosis and long-term medication with it. It's a, it's a surgical treatment. So again, ADHD in a kid, at least that should be thought about and brought up to your, your primary care provider yes. and maybe even see an ear, nose, and throat, especially. If, I think if they have ADHD and large tonsils, I think you should see an ear, nose, and throat doctor. Absolutely. Yeah, and that it is, 50% uh, was our latest latest study on that, and I think it's a, a good number I mean, that we see. Yeah, a yeah big any, any, as a parent, I can imagine if you can cure, you know, uh, you know, not have your have kid, you know, kid have to have medications and have that, um, that's, um, that's a, that's a no-brainer. Yeah. Good information. Mm -hmm. That was very interesting at the end. Thank you. Mm -hmm. We've come to the end of our time. If you have any more questions, uh, you can ask those on bch.org. Thank you for your time tonight, and uh, the video will be posted in a couple of days.